Hello and welcome to Cross Examination, the radio ministry of First Church of Christ in Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania. I'm Pastor Ryan Parrish, and I'm so happy you're joining us as we begin a series of messages that will be re examining some ideas of great consequence. In a courtroom setting, the cross examination is when the witnesses or the expert testimony is tested and challenged by the other side to see if it holds up. Is it trustworthy and credible? For disciples of Jesus, and anyone really, it's important that what we learn and what we hear is carefully thought through in light of what the scriptures say. And the more we learn, the better able we are to do this. I invite you to share in my journey as we delve into some important issues that I realized require a second look. This morning we're going to take some time to look at what the scriptures, specifically the New Covenant scriptures, have to say about the phrase, the last days. And the reason I want to do this is to help uh, offer some perspective and maybe clarify some things that are often, I think, mystified far more than is needed, far more than is helpful in a lot of teachings about what we call eschatology or the study of last things. Now, eschatology is actually a really broad and deep subject, as we're going to see. But the way we normally talk about it, the way it's usually taught, and the way the seminars usually go, the language of eschatology usually centers around the immediate, let's say, seven years or three and a half years of what people understand will happen just before or just after Jesus' second coming or the second advent or second appearing. That would be when Jesus physically, literally comes into our sky as he and his apostles promised. Now, that's actually an immense thing to study, something that we must uh, become really clear about, joyful about, hopeful in, because that really is the hope of every disciple, of the church of all ages of all times, that Jesus is going to return. And with his return comes the fullness of all things God has promised, the new creation, the resurrection of the dead, all those really important things. So, and none of those things are, are going to be disrupted in this, because <laughs> those are wonderful, beautiful, and worth celebrating. I am not cross-examining those doctrines. Um, what I want to focus on in this cross-examination time is how the language of last days is treated in popular teaching, in common teaching. So what I have done is pulled up in the Bible, and I used a, an online uh, program for this. You can do that, or you can use a, a book form of a concordance. Um, and you can do this either in English or the original languages. It gets you the same result here. But I want to look at how in the New Testament specifically, the phrase or the language of the last days is used, because I think it might be surprising to a lot of people to find out, and I'll give you kind of the, the answer up front here, that we have been in the last days since Jesus returned to the Father. And that was about 40 days after his resurrection. So for nearly 2,000 years now, we have been in the last days. And I'm going to walk through the texts that use that phrase so that we can see whether that's true or not. Um, again, I'm kind of giving you the punchline here at the beginning. I don't know if I should or not. But I want to, at the very end of this, I want to talk about why that matters. Why is uh, this cross-examination of this phrase meaningful to us? Uh, again, I want to just reassure you, I'm not coming into these things just to say others are wrong or make myself sound right about controversial issues. I only want to bring things up that I think impact the way we think and therefore the way we behave as disciples of Jesus in the world right here and now. Because the clearer we are on the way Jesus and his apostles, the prophets of the Old Covenant scriptures, the clearer we are on what they actually said, what God has actually said and promised through them, I think the more effective we can be. 
Um, and so whenever we're misunderstanding God, which by the way, I still do, I'm sure, and I'm seeking that clarity my, myself from others, and that's something all disciples need to constantly be doing. But the more clarity we get, the more uh, ably we can interact with God and his world to do the work he has for us to do without having any misconceptions or false assumptions getting in our way. So, again, if you're thinking of the last days as being future-oriented only, you know, clustered around the last several years before Jesus' advent, his return in his resurrected physical body to give us our resurrected physical bodies. Um, if that's what you're thinking, I just want to help clarify how actually it's bigger and more beautiful even than that when we talk about the last days. So the fir first place this comes up is in Acts chapter 2 in verse 17. This is in that uh, very important, and I, I think we'll see why the situation that's going on when these words are spoken uh, shows why it's so important that this phrase is used here. Uh, but the situation is on the day of Pentecost, that high holy Jewish day, uh, the many people from around the Roman Empire have come to Jerusalem, as the law said they should, to celebrate that holy day of Pentecost, which is a day of celebration of the harvest. And when they're there in large numbers, the disciples of Jesus who are gathered in Jerusalem in an upper room, who are doing what they've been told by the Master himself, they've been waiting for power to come, the p promised Holy Spirit. Uh, they're there waiting as Jesus instructed with teeming thousands upon thousands of other faithful Jews in Jerusalem as well. And if you remember, as you look to Acts chapter 2, as they're praying together, the room where they are meeting is shaken. The wind, uh, presumably of God himself, blows through powerfully. Fire comes down and it separates and lands on each one of the people there as if tongues of fire. The people are then given power by the Holy Spirit to speak languages they had never spoken before, supernaturally learned languages, began to speak those languages uh, in praise to God, just giving him praise for what he had been doing. And I have no doubt that has to do with what he'd been doing through Messiah Jesus. Well, that, of course, gathers a crowd, uh, very curious, uh, lots of Jews there. You know, this is early in the morning, about 9 a.m., and a lot of Jews are very curious as to why their fellow Jews are doing this. Uh, what is the sound? How can this be happening? Because people from all over the empire are hearing languages from all over the empire. And they can tell these people aren't from all over the empire like us. So why are they able to do this? Well, Peter gets up. And this is, I'm going to pick it up here uh, with Peter's address to this crowd, the first part of it in uh, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 14, and listen for the language of the last days. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, meaning the eleven apostles, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. If I could pause there, uh, Obviously, there were people in the crowd who were wondering about, you know, how amazing this is, and others were kind of scoffing and dismissing it as, ah, they drank too much wine. So Peter's addressing that false accusation. He said, these people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. <laughs> no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And now he's quoting the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. 
I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, that passage that he just quoted from Joel is from Joel chapter 2, verses 20 to 32. Now, when Joel wrote it, in the time of the Old Covenant, hundreds of years before Peter quotes it. It was certainly a future statement. In those days, in the future, in the last days, right? From Joel's point of view and the people he was talking to as a prophet. In the last days, in the future. Now, by the time Peter is speaking the words, he is speaking them as being fulfilled in his time, first century, the first third of the first century. So how is it that almost 2,000 years later, things are still going on if 2,000 years ago, Peter is using the language of in the last days as being right now? And the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on all people was uh, being kind of tickled. Uh, it's, it's being fulfilled in miniature by what happened on the day of Pentecost. And according to Peter, this is just the beginning of God fulfilling this prophecy through Joel. And as you read through the book of Acts, you see it coming more and more to fulfillment. Everywhere the gospel goes, the Spirit is coming on people, men and women, old and young, and he's giving people dreams, and he's moving people to prophesy, and he's giving them visions, and he's doing exactly what he said he would do. And so, back then, in the first days of the church's emergence as a gifted, powerful force in the world, it's a manifestation of the last days starting. So, how can we be sure? that Peter meant to say the language of last days applied to his time. Again, listen to what he says to introduce the quote. He says, no, these people aren't drunk. This, meaning this manifestation of the Holy Spirit's power to give us these different languages, this event is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And the prophet Joel's prediction begins with the phrase, in the last days. So that's the first time in the New Covenant Scriptures we see this phrase come up. And it clearly says, in context and with everything that's happening, that Peter understood that he and his fellow apostles and those other disciples were experiencing the spirit-infused power of the last days that God had promised. The last days were already upon them. Now, a, another use of the phrase last days comes up in 2 Timothy. And this is one that you'll hear used very often in what we call eschatology, as I mentioned. Uh, and especially in a teaching that says that as we approach the last days, and again, I'm using that to speak of you know the last cluster of years just before and around the time of Jesus' second appearing, uh, that things will become worse than they have ever been in the human story. So I'm going to go here to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, let me read what Paul wrote to Timothy. And I'm going to go from uh, chapter 3 from verse 1 to verse 5. So take it all in. And especially pay attention to how Paul ends this pretty much really long sentence here with a warning to Timothy in the first century of what to do about it. Okay, so this is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Paul wrote, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, 
ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. That's what he said about the last days. That's, that's his uh, expansion on the idea that there will be terrible times in the last days. But now listen to what Paul says to Timothy. Here's what Timothy needs to do about this as he marks this. He says to end of verse 5, Have nothing to do with such people. Now, the way this is usually quoted, and this is where cross-examination is in order, is to say that when you look around us at how far uh, down the, the spiral of sin and disorder and immorality and all those things, that surely we're living in the last days because that's exactly the way Paul said things would go here in 2 Timothy 3. So as you see the deterioration of society, it's a sure sign that we must be close, like really close, to the second appearing of Jesus. Now, typically, if they're going to quote it to that effect, they're not going to focus on what Paul, 2,000 years ago, told Timothy to do about it. Here's why. If Paul was thinking that sometime in the unknown future, uh, distant or close, however it might be, just around the time of Jesus' uh, second appearing, this is how things are going to look. Why would he speak to Timothy at that time as if it were already true? What did Paul say to Timothy? Have nothing to do with such people. What people? The people who match his description of the terrible times. People who, for instance, I mean, it's a long list again, I won't go through the whole thing, people who love themselves. Is that really a new and modern thing? No. Lovers of money. Is that a new and modern thing? No. Boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy. Like, you go through the list, and you say, actually, humans have been that way since Paul wrote these words. And Paul, if we could talk to him, would say, well, of course, that was my point. There will be terrible times in the last days, and I think both he and Timothy knew they were in the last days because the gospel had come, because they knew the prophecy of Joel too, because just like Peter, they understood that God was up to something new and climactic in the coming of Jesus Messiah. And so when Paul says there will be terrible times in the last days, he tells Timothy to mark this and to have nothing to do with such people because Timothy was living in the terrible times of the last days. That's why Timothy had to mark it and pass this message along to his fellow disciples where he was because they were going to be experiencing it because they were in the last days already. So have nothing to do with such people, Paul said. Now, if this had to do with the, you know, end of the world, the way up there, wherever it's going to be, how can Timothy have nothing to do with such people if they're not here yet? If they're going to be around in the 21st century? Well, Timothy really has no option but to have nothing to do with them, right? So again, if you look at this second text, just like if you look at that first text in Acts chapter 2, you find out that all signs point to the last days being inaugurated by the coming of Messiah and the sending of the Holy Spirit. Now, why would terrible times flow in the last days if God is doing something new and wonderful in the last days, like we saw back in Acts chapter 2, as quoted from Joel chapter 2? Well, because this is a war. And as God ramps up his kingdom invasion force, his determination through the gospel of his son Jesus to win the nations to himself 
free them from the power of the dark one. As it says in Colossians to uh, rescue them from the dominion of darkness and bring them into the kingdom of the Son he loves. We would expect that the kingdom of darkness would ramp up as well. This is warfare. This is what you expect. The kingdom of darkness is not just going to look wide-eyed in fear as the kingdom comes and then fall apart on itself. It has a lot to lose. The kingdom of darkness has a lot to lose as the kingdom of God invades. And so it will do everything it can to try to poison as much as it can. And you see this in Revelation chapter 12 as the dragon who's cast out of heaven down to earth and sea. He's furious and knows his time is short and he declares war on, if you are, you know, familiar with the language of the Revelation, on the rest of the offspring of the woman. And we're told in Revelation 12 who they are. They are the ones who are faithful to Jesus. So, the faithful ones to Jesus are going to be targeted by the dark one and his kingdom. Just as the ones trapped in the dark one's kingdom are targeted by God to be rescued, which is glorious. That's the good news gospel. We get to celebrate everybody. Oh, I will never want to lose sight and never want to lose the joy and the wonder of that. It is so beautiful. Well, all that to say, there's, a, I think, a striking similarity here uh, as we talk about why would there be such terrible times in the last days. When you consider the fact there seemed to be a great uptick in uh, the activity of demonic possession, at least obvious demonic possession, when Jesus and the apostles were doing their great miraculous work of healing and setting people free from those demonic powers. And, And many people who study the scriptures have concluded a part of the reason the demonic activity was uh, becoming more obvious and more apparent was because the power of God was so clearly at work in his servant Messiah Jesus and in his apostles and the church beyond the apostles. So that, again, when the power of God is ramping up the invasion force, the power of darkness responds. And so the terrible times in the last days, I think it makes perfect sense, are going to parallel the times of power and refreshment from God among his people, because that is the war that's being waged. So we continue now uh, to the next passage that speaks of the last days. And this one is perhaps clearer than any that we've seen so far in just the language itself. And this is in Hebrews chapter 1. So let me read the first several verses here. And again, listen for that language of the last days. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. In these last days, writes the author of the letter to he, to the Hebrews. He's writing in the first century. And he's kind of encapsulating the fact that God spoke to us by his son with what Jesus not only did in his mortal ministry, but also in his being seated at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Because it's at that point that he pours out his Holy Spirit and sends out his servants into the world to speak his message for him. And so, thus is inaugurated, again, the last days, these last days, from the first century forward. And this is starting to give us a reason 
to want clarity on this language. See, if we understand, along with our first century brothers and sisters, and second century, and third century, and, you know, go on down the line, if we see ourselves as a part of the people of the last days, then what we understand is that we are a part of something special that God's been up to. And the length of time it lasts isn't the issue. It's not like, you know, if it goes if it goes to the 20 second century, we're going to have a real problem calling it the last days. No, we won't. Because last has nothing to do with number of days. Last has to do with quality of days before the end of the age. And that's what last days indicates. Last days of what? Of this old age. Of this old order of things. And so I don't know how long that will last. Neither do you. And that's okay. We're not meant to. Because we only have a small chunk of those last days anyways, brothers and sisters. How, how many there are aren't, isn't really our concern. It's what we do with the ones we're a part of, right? I'm 40 now. I don't know how many more years the Lord will grant me in this mortal life of mine. But let's just say it's 80, you know? Let's just say I, let's, I get to live to 80, okay? By God's grace. If I get to live 80 years of the last days before the end of the age, am I going to be a part of what God's doing in the last days? And what is he doing? Well, I'm not saying he can't have different tactics throughout the time period, but we do know his overall program, right? We know his overall mission in the last days. It's to rescue those who are in the dominion of darkness and bring them into the kingdom of the Son he loves. It's to turn those who are uh, ensnared in the darkness and reveal the light of the glory of Christ to them. It's to transform them from being uh, subjects of the kingdom of rebellion and brought into the fullness of righteousness, true obedience, true goodness, kindness, forgiveness, generosity, all those things, mercy. I mean, that's his that's his purpose. That's what he's doing. It's what he's been doing throughout the last days through the gospel of Jesus. And I want to be a part of that. I want you to be a part of that and not focus all of your energies of the last days focus that you have on, I wonder how it will turn out or this teacher on the TV or that teacher in that book is going to spell out all the international geopolitical maneuverings that will lead up to Jesus's return. That isn't what we're shown in the New Testament anywhere. What we're shown in the New Testament is how to be fruitful and effective in our sliver of the last days. Because God has so much to do before he brings an end to this old order of things. And thank God he's going to, but also thank God he's patient in doing so. I mean, imagine if 41 years ago, God decided to end this old age. I'm not here, right? And some of you maybe aren't here. Or maybe some of you were here, but you weren't following him yet 41 years ago. So thank God he's going to end it. Thank God he hasn't yet. But since he hasn't yet, there's work he's wanting to get done and he's calling his people to do it. And that's really the main reason I wanted to cover this and and bring clarity to this. We are a people on mission with a calling. And the last days is supposed to fuel that zeal in our hearts because the last days represents something. It's the last days of God's great work before he brings an end to this old order of things. Will it be terrible? In some aspects, yes. But I mean, Paul already articulated that pretty well. And you can just look around and see, in our situation at least, that that's true. But that doesn't mean it's just about to end, or else it was just about to end in the first century too. But it didn't. And maybe Jesus' second appearing is right around the corner from this moment I'm saying these words. But maybe not. And again, that isn't really going to change, I hope. What we do, because what we do 
is faithful service to the work of God in these last days, in these terrible times, from the viewpoint of what the dark one is going to want to do, but from these powerful and refreshing times from the viewpoint of what God's looking to do. And, and I, I just want to make sure we're focusing on what our Father and our Master and our helping spirit, what they are set to do through us, rather than obsessing with, I mean, we need to mark it so that we can avoid certain people, like Paul said, but we're not going to focus all of our time and attention on the terrible times element of it. We need to have that in mind to be wise, but no, we're, we're focused on what is the Holy Spirit being sent in this time right now to accomplish in us, through us. So let's carry on. In uh, James chapter 5, verse 3, again, very clear indication that as James, the half-brother of Jesus, an elder in the Jerusalem church, as he's writing to warn certain people, particularly in this text, rich people, about being too caught up in this present age, he uses the language of last days to remind them that there isn't a whole lot left of this old order of things, so don't cling to it. Now again, he's, he wrote that, you know, 1900 years ago, 19 and a half centuries ago, but he wasn't wrong. By the way, they were going to be passing away as mortals as it was. But he's talking about this order of things where wealth is such a big deal and corruption and all that stuff. Uh, it gets to have a place of prominence and people who are uh, unjust can get ahead in this world. He's like, you know, that order of things, it's, go it's passing, guys. It's in its death throes, right? Why would you want to be a part of that when you've been offered the inheritance of an endless kingdom? I mean, that, that all underlies things he writes in his letter. But here's what he says as he rebukes some of the rich people in the assembly of the disciples. In James chapter 5, verse 3, it says, Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Now, if you're familiar with James's letter, you know that man could use language to pack a punch. <laughs> he is so poetic, so image rich in his words. I mean, if, if you take him at all seriously and you're one of the people he's rebuking, I mean, you just got the shudders. You just got the chills. And you want to repent. Because if you know the message of the kingdom, that it has come, it is at hand, and that these are the last days of the Dark One's kingdom, he's on his way out, the eternal kingdom of God is all that's going to remain, then you recognize what James is saying and you are moved to repent. You know what? Why am I obsessing with the wealth I have? And why am I cheating workers out of their labor and being so unmerciful to them? For what? It's kind of like uh, if you were alive in the time of the Civil War and you had currency from the Confederacy and you knew that the war was ending, you knew that the the North was going to win, would you hoard the Southern currency? It's not going to be worth anything. It's going to be useless to you. And, and so it's kind of like that. The, the old order is ending, so why would I hold on to what's valuable in the old order? I need to turn my mind and my attentions to what's going to be valuable in the lasting order of things, which is God's kingdom. And uh, again, this is why the language of last days is so powerful for us, right here and now. Because the last days are already upon us. The final text uh, to consider together is in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Now this is a text that actually does deal with the things at the very end in the return of Christ, in the destruction of the old order of things, in its totality as the new creation is brought about. So let me read this text to you and so you can hear it in its flow. 
and then we'll see what it means in reference to the last days. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now he goes on to talk about the day of the Lord. It says it will come like a thief and things will be destroyed and elementally, like at the elemental level, things will be destroyed. And he ends that thought with his beautiful promise in verse 13, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Now, in the flow of that, he says they must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. Now again, why would they need to know that? He says above all. Well, why is it so urgent for them to know that if he's talking about the distant future in that cluster of years around the second appearing of Jesus? Why, why would those people back then need to know that above all if that were the case? That's not why he wrote that. He wrote that because they were living in the last days and they needed to be ready for the scoffers that were going to be coming and that were already there saying these things. Now, Peter wrote this decades after Jesus went back to the Father. And I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the earliest disciples really did think Jesus would be returning soon. Uh, they had a very uh, Israel, Jewish focus, no doubt, at the very beginning. And, I mean, even in the book of Acts, we hear of Peter speaking to Jews, talking about that if they would come to Christ, if, if they would embrace Messiah and they would repent and come to God through Christ, that times of refreshing would come and the Messiah would return. Right? I and mean, so there's already that language in the first decade of the church of longing for his coming, longing for his return. So, of course, it's not unusual that Peter and those he wrote to, and Paul and James and the writer of Hebrews and all these people saw themselves in the last days because Jesus purposefully set it up that every generation of the church could long for his appearing and reasonably expect it. Now, they've been wrong every generation up to this one, and very possibly this generation is wrong when we assume it's going to be our generation. And that's not bad. Again, I believe that is the design of our Master. How often, he said, in his parables, a Master went away left his servants in charge of his estate, whether it's money or his other servants or whatever it is, and he didn't tell them when he'd be coming back. And there was going to be a reward for those who kept watch and kept busy while they waited and didn't get lazy and didn't abuse the other servants and didn't drink the master's wine, right, and all those other things because they assumed, ah, it'll be forever. 
It's that sense of readiness. It's that sense of anticipation, of eagerness, of what Paul calls loving the appearing of the master. And there's a blessing for those who love his appearing, who yearn for it, actually. And so in these last days, scoffers are going to come. And I want to ask you, disciple, have you seen that or heard that? This scoffing, uh, this idea that we Christians who all this time later are obviously unsophisticated, obviously um, naive or superstitious or you know whatever the language is used. People use different language to say these things. But it's, it's clearly not educated or scientific or sophisticated to think that that's what our future hope is. I mean, we've got to, we've got to be focused on the here and now. We've got to solve these problems ourselves because the earth's got issues and, you know, we've got to figure out how to maybe get off this earth and find another place to live. Like, you know, all the sci-fi scenarios. That's the only other direction your mind can go. Either Jesus comes and, and brings hope and newness and an eternal life in a good new world, in a new heavens, a new earth, or humanity's got to figure out another way to get that done on our own because eventually the sun's going to burn out or an asteroid's going to hit. You know what I mean? I mean, this, this scoffing is real. and It's not exactly in the wording that Peter gave there. That was the wording maybe in his generation. But to be honest with you, I've heard similar language used even in my lifetime. Everything in the way it's always been. You Christians, every time something happens, you say, it's the end of the world, Jesus is coming, and then nothing happens. Which, by the way, it's true. A lot of Christians have embarrassed themselves and all of us by setting dates and saying that's the Antichrist and that's the mark of the beast and this is this and this is this and it doesn't pan out. And so they change their books or they explain away why they got it wrong and it didn't get it wrong. God just said, well, this is what we're doing now. And Yeah, I get it. It is embarrassing and I wish people would stop doing that. That's one reason why I'm sharing what I'm sharing with you in this message. I want us to be clear on what he said so that we can be clear in what we say. We don't have to fumble around. We don't have to take these missteps. We don't have to listen and believe people who are going way beyond what Jesus said, way beyond what the scriptures say, what the apostles said. We can be grounded in what was actually written and not go off of snippets that, you know, these teachers and books and and seminars, they they throw snippets of the scriptures at you. They don't explore what those scriptures are actually talking about at the time. They just use this language that fits what they're saying. No. You know, in the spirit of cross-examination, and I'm not just wanting to do this myself, but encourage you to do this yourself, Take in what you're hearing and say, now let's go back and see what was Paul talking about? What was Peter talking about? What was James writing about? What was the context? Who were they saying this applied to? And it applied to them then, not to some unknown generation in the distant future. So the last days are upon us, brothers and sisters. There's no doubt about it. But not because all the signs point to Jesus' second appearing being decades, years, months away, but because the old order is still around. And ever since Pentecost, at least, maybe even earlier, I actually believe it was earlier, I believe it was when Jesus came announcing the kingdom's arrival. The last days began. You could, you could start the clock on a new phase of, of time, the last days. So as long as this old order remains, we can certainly say we're in the last days. And what that means, and forgive me if I repeat myself here at the end, but this is so important for us, and I hope encouraging to you, and I hope invigorates your spirit all over again. 
with a vision of what you are here to do, what you've been not only called to do, but gifted to do. If you are in covenant with Jesus, if you've received the seal of his Holy Spirit, you are a part of the last day's work of God. Peter was, Stephen was, Paul was. Every disciple of Jesus for the last almost 2,000 years have been working together, empowered by the same spirit, the same vision, the same calling, to do what God is determined to do before he draws the curtain on this old creation. And the people that you see around you every day that are trapped in the old creation way that will end in destruction. They have a, a window of time in these last days to find freedom, to be transformed, to go from being an enemy of God to his son or daughter with a place at his table, a servant in his kingdom. You yourself, disciple, have this window of time to train to become more and more like your master Jesus, more and more pleasing to your father. So that all of the old things be shed like a skin. You've taken off the old self, as Paul wrote, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. It's in these last days that this must happen. We are not the kind of people if we're going to take what our master Jesus and his apostles wrote and said seriously, we are not the kind of people who look at the rotten, terrible times that we're living in and say, well, at least that means Jesus is coming soon. Maranatha, Lord, get us out of here. No. That is never the call we see written in the scriptures. What we see is the awareness of the last days being terrible times is also the last days being times of God's powerful movement through His Spirit poured out on all flesh so that the men and women, the young and the old, are given power to prophesy, have visions and dreams, so that all who call on the name of the Lord can be saved. And what did Peter do with that? Peter called on the people there in Jerusalem to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. And they said, brothers, what do we do? And he gave them the answer. He didn't say, well, sorry, you're going to burn, but at least we're okay. No, he knew the heart of Father God, the heart of Master Jesus, the heart of the Helper Spirit. And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He offered them life. He offered them hope. He offered them newness. And he couldn't offer it to them except that Jesus had already offered it. And that's what we do too. We don't just bemoan the darkness. Amen? Come on. I know how easy that is. Or at least for me it is. Maybe not for you. Look around. Say, well, Paul was right. Terrible times in the last days. Sure. But are you also saying God was right? There's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in these last days to get some powerful, miraculous things done, to push back the power of the dark one, to set prisoners free, to announce the good news to the poor, to open the eyes of the blind, to cause the lame to walk and the dead to live again. Now, some of you can take that a little more literally than others. Depends how you view the miraculous in these last days in that way. Whether you take it as a metaphor for the spiritual things or you actually believe that can happen in the physical realm, take it for what it is as you understand the scriptures to reveal it. But what I'm saying is in these last days, it's not just terrible times. It's also powerful times. Because Satan may be all furious because his time is short, as Revelation 12 said. But God, he is steady. He is determined. 
and he is ready to work through you and to work through me and to work through all the disciples of Jesus who love and know him. Because when we submit, Father is ready to go. Father isn't needing to be convinced that he ought to act in this world. He's the one that so loved the world, he gave his one unique son so that whoever trusts him won't die, but will have the life of the age, the age to come. That's what that means. Eternal life, remember, is the English translation of what is more strictly translated life of the age, the age life. And we who are alive mortally in the last days, we, we can act courageously and fearlessly and boldly because our lives don't end with this old order. Yeah, our mortal bodies do. But they're kind of broken anyway, you know. As amazing as they are, they're broken. They're going to die. But we get to carry on into the new age with immortal bodies as Jesus resurrects us. Right? That's fantastic. We have nothing to hold on to in this old order. We want to take everything of meaning and value to God into the new age, into the new creation. And that's why we focus on what ma matters to Him in this last chunk of the time clock of human history, the last days. So will you focus on human beings? Because they are valuable to God. Will you focus on His good word? Because that's valuable to God. Will you focus on mercy, faithfulness, justice? Because those are valuable to God, according to Jesus. Those are the more important matters of the law. I encourage you, disciple. Let the truth of the fact that we are a part of the last days, in the sense that the whole church, through the whole age of the church, has been in the last days so that you can join in on the work of the last days and not be caught up and enslaved by the meaningless things of the old order that is soon to fade away, never to rise again. Amen. That concludes this morning's message, and I hope it was an encouragement to you and reminds you of the greatness of Jesus and the greatness of his love for you. Before we go, I want to invite you to join us each Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. as we gather as a church family here at 1437 Tyrone Pike in Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania. If you're a follower of Jesus, we'd love to continue to minister to you and help you become more like him, as well as invite you to minister to us with the gifts the Holy Spirit has given you. If you're someone who's still investigating, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and why you should follow him. We would love to help you in that process as well. We also welcome you to visit our website at fcocpa.org where you'll find many resources, both video and audio, that are designed to help you understand and follow Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thanks again for joining us and may God bless you until next time. Bye-bye.